So let's talk about what's going on. We are entering into the third part of the course. Now in the first part of the course, we learned a lot about things like how to solve constant coefficient ordinary differential equations, and the idea was turn it into an algebra problem, solve the algebra problem, in this case finding roots, and translate that back into a solution. Then we hit the second part of the course. And in the second part of the course, we learned about how to solve systems of differential equations. And the idea was turned into an algebra problem. And that algebra problem dealt with finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then saying, okay, once we have that, how do we turn those back into solutions? Well, now we're into the third part of the course. And in the third part of the course, we're going to talk about some algebra tools to help solve differential equations. So the idea here is we have our differential equation problem and we want the differential equation solution. So this is what we want to do. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to say, hey, let's utilize algebra. So the picture is we go from our differential equation into algebra, we solve the algebra, and go back into our differential equation solution. Now you might say, well, okay, what kind of algebra are we going to encounter? So, so far, we've done a lot of work with finding roots. Are we doing the same thing here? And, uh, well, not quite. Here, we're going to do things such as simplifying, We'll do a little bit of factoring, but of course, the fun thing we're gonna do is partial fractions. Yes, I feel the excitement too. I can, I can just like, oh, really, really, yeah. Totally true, totally true. So that's where we're going. So, okay, so how does this work? So the idea here is we're going to introduce something called the Laplace transform. All right, well, what's that? Well, it's something which takes a function and it's going to make a new function. We've seen this kind of philosophy before. Things like derivatives. You, you take a function, you apply the derivative to it, out comes a new function. Or antiderivatives, which is even closer to the idea. You take a function, do the antiderivative, out comes a new function. So, What's happening here? Well, the idea is we're going to take our original function, f of t. We're going to do the Laplace transform, which means that we're going to use this really fancy l here. So very fancy. You can tell by how fancy our l is. And out it's going to come a new function, f of s, defined by this integral. Now, this integral might be making you a little bit nervous, because you're like, ah. Oh, are we going to have to keep doing that integral again and again? And the answer is no. Because that's not the way we, we work. The way we work is you say, all right, let's build up a collection of rules. In other words, some basic properties and a few simple functions. And from those combinations of functions and properties, we'll be able to handle the ones that we're interested in. Now you might say, well, well, which functions do we care about? Well, it's the usual suspects. The exponential functions, the sine, the cosine, and t to a power. And that's mostly it. Pretty much anything that's not there, we're not going to use this technique on. So we're not going to do anything with like secants or tangents. Those are, are not going to be part of our conversation. So these are our functions that we're going to work with. These and, and piecewise variations of them. All right, so we have to start and think about what's our rules? Well, let's start with something very simple. We do an integration problem. Say, all right, we inherit anything that's true about integration. One thing that's true is that integration is linear. Now that allows us to break things apart. So, for example, if I want to take some constant times a first function, some other constant times a second function, I can pull the constant outside, 
of this Laplace transform. And I can break the Laplace transform into pieces. So that says, OK, good. We break things up just like we're used to with derivatives, just like what we're used to with integration. There's a few other things to say. It says, look, if I have the Laplace transform of f equals the Laplace transform of g, and f and g are reasonable, then it really has to be the case that f equals g. So this is what allows us to say is like, if I can transform my problem into my new setting and I can solve it, well, that had to be the right answer because there's really only one possible outcome. There's also something called the inverse Laplace transform. The inverse Laplace transform works more or less like what you think it would do. It says, hey, I have the answer. What's the question? So in other words, if I know what f of s is, what is f of t? That's, that's what we're after. Now you might say, well, that sounds complicated. And you're right. It is complicated. And the way we do this is we don't have a formula for it. We just learn to look things up on a table. Now that might sound somewhat unsatisfying to say, oh, we're just learning how to read a table? Is that really what math is about? But if you stop and think about Calc 2, when you talked about antiderivatives, how many things can you actually take the antiderivative of at the end of the day? Not very many. Usually we just have you memorize 10. But even that, we could, we could really narrow it down to maybe three or four if we had to. There's only a, a small number of things we actually know how to take antiderivatives of. Everything else is learning how do you make it look like something that you know. So that's oftentimes where the algebra comes into play. How do you make an expression look like something that you know? And once it looks like something that you know, then you can say, aha, I know what the answer is. I'm going to make one more observation. This is not going to be so important, but there's going to come a time next week when I'm going to pull it back and I'm going to say, ah, this will help us. It just says, when we take the Laplace transform of a function, the function that we have has to go to zero as s goes to infinity. And you might say, well, well how can we see that? Well, come back to our definition. So when I plug in a very large number for s, what's happening to e to the minus st? So if s is big, e to the minus st is very small. And as s gets bigger, it drives this term to 0. And so what you end up with is taking the integral of something which is very, very close to 0 and getting closer. And that's why the function goes to 0. All right. So that's the idea. That's the idea. And we're going to do a lot of practice with this. We have two weeks that we're going to spend learning about Laplace transforms and getting at least mildly comfortable with the basics of it. All right. Any questions before we start building up our list of rules? OK. Well, in that case, let's start with perhaps our favorite type of function, the exponential function. Now here, we have no facts available to us. So when we have nothing available to us, we have to go back to the definition. So we'll, we'll pull up the definition for reference. We say, all right, if we want to take the Laplace transform of e to the ct, this will be the integral 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times e to the ct dt. All right, so that's applying the definition. And notice here, it looks like there's two variables, s and t. But what's going to happen with your t's? Well, you'll integrate, and then you evaluate. And after the integration and evaluation, the t's will go away. 
So the, what's going to be left is an expression only involving s. OK, so we have this e to the minus st, e to the ct. What do we do? What can we do? Can you put them on top of each other? Someone said put them on top of each other? In what sense? Well, OK, 1 over e to the negative st is indeed 1 over e to the st. Uh, but it, it's an integration form. It's a little bit nicer to have it upstairs. Uh, someone said add the exponents. Are we allowed to do that? If I have e to something times e to something, am I allowed to add exponents? Yeah, you are. Totally true story. All right, so this is the integral, 0 to infinity of e to the minus st plus ct, whoops, ct dt. Well, we can do something a little bit better than that. We'll write this as e to the minus something t dt. What goes in the parentheses? S minus c. All right, well, how do you integrate something like this? How do you integrate e to something t? Yeah, you divide by what's in front of the t. When in doubt, it's like I turn to the equation sheet. If the equation sheet is good. The equation sheet is wise. Okay, so divide by what's in front of the, the t. So the what's in front of the t is this minus s minus c. So, so the minus is going to be incorporated in. So it'll be minus 1 over s minus c, e to the minus s minus c times t, and you evaluate 0 to infinity. All right, so the question, what happens as you let t head off towards infinity? It goes to 0. Now you might say, wait, doesn't it depend on the relationship between s and c? We'll always assume s is sufficiently large. So for s sufficiently large, yeah. So we're going to get 0. What happens when you plug in t equals 0? Well, e to the 0 is 1. So we get, we're going to subtract negative 1 over s minus c. And that means we get the answer is 1 over s minus c. All right, good. We've added something to our list. Very useful something, too, I might add. By the way, can you tell me what the Laplace transform is of 1? One over s. 1 over s. How do we know that? Because this is c equals 0, right? e to the 0 t is 1. We could, of course, check that directly. All right, good. One property down. We know how to take the transforms of exponential functions, which it turns out you can get a lot just knowing that. A lot. OK, uh, the next one. Suppose we know the Laplace transform of f of t is equal to f of s. So in other words, I know how to take f of t and do that Laplace transform. And now I want to find what happens if I add an e to the ct onto it. So what's the Laplace transform of e to the ct? Well, all right. We don't know much. So what do we do? Hmm. Well, the answer is we go to our definitions. So right now, we are told that f of s is equal to the integral 0 to infinity of e to the minus st f of t dt. That's just the definition. So that's what that first part is telling us. And now, we're looking at the Laplace transform, e to the ct f of t. 
Well, first step, plug in the definition. So this is equal to the integral, 0 to infinity, of e to the minus st times e to the ct f of t dt. What can we do? Yeah, we can, we can follow what we were doing over here. So this is integral 0 to infinity. And I'm just going to go ahead and just skip two steps. e to the minus s minus c t f of t dt. And now we start comparing. You say, well, how close are these two expressions? Or how much are they different? Here I, I see an s. Here I see an s minus c. That's how much they differ by. So what does that say about the answer? Notice, this is the only place where s shows up. What we've done is that we say, ah, it's an s minus c. So, we can think of this, this is sort of like our, our new s. Yes? It's acting like what the s should do. So in particular, this is f of s minus c. Right? Just imagine, come up here, plug in s minus c, then you'd put an s minus c there. Well, that's what we have. So we say, oh, so, so this is interesting. Multiplying by an exponential does what to the outcome? Yeah, it shifts over. Ah, so when we, so the word offset someone said, very good description. So when we see offset, we're like, oh, that means there was an exponential function involved. Okay, good, good. So far, so good? You got it? Two functions in? Well, I should say one function, one property. All right, are you ready? Your turn. We'll just have you pick one. Which one do you want, the, the singe or the cosh? So, so Hyperbolic sine called singe, hyperbolic cosine called cosh. And it turns out they really look more like exponential functions than they do like trig functions. So you might say, it's kind of weird we call these sines and cosines. So for instance, hyperbolic sine looks something roughly like this. Hyperbolic cosine looks something roughly like this. By the way, now that you've seen the curve, you're like, oh, I've seen that curve. I know what curve that is. Do you, do you recognize the curve, Cauch curve? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. Imagine that you saw some things here, and maybe you, you saw... Now do you recognize it? You can imagine that there's a, a place here where the cars can drive on. Yeah, like, like the Golden Gate Bridge, or any time you have a big hanging chain, that's the Koch curve. It's not a parabola. You know, big algebra's been trying to sell you that it's parabola. No, no, it, it, it's this Koch curve. So let's go through and say, well, what's happening with Koch? So the idea here, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We should we look back and say, have we seen things before? So if we're doing Koch, we say, well, what makes up Koch? And we see that the thing that makes Koch up is right here. It's the parts of an exponential function. In fact, some people would say this is the even part of the exponential function. Now, there's a property 
of the Laplace transform that was mentioned at the very beginning. Do you remember a, a useful property that the Laplace transform has? Linear. linear. This is a linear combination of functions. So we can rewrite this as one half the Laplace transform of e to the bt plus one half the Laplace transform of e to the minus bt. Now, why does that make it useful? Well, do we know how to take the Laplace transform of e to the bt? Yes, it's one over s minus b plus one half and here, 1 over, yeah, it's s, you can think of it as minus a minus. So you say, okay, so it's 1 over s minus b, 1 over s plus b, and there's a half in there. Well, putting on our algebra hats, because that's what we're in. We're doing a lot of algebra here. If we wanted to put these together, what would we want to do? Common denominator. So, what do I need to multiply the first expression by? S plus B. So this is S plus B. Downstairs it's 2 S minus B, S plus B. Here, where I have S plus B, what do I need to multiply by? S minus B. So downstairs we'll have 2 S plus B, S minus B. So I'm multiplying both top and bottom by either s minus b or s plus b. Now, common denominator, we're allowed to add. s plus b, s minus b, what happens? 2s, the b's cancel. 2, s minus b times s plus b. What's another way to say that? s squared minus b squared. And then we say, aha, the 2's. They cancel. They do. And so we're left with s over s squared minus b squared. So there you go. There's, there's the Laplace transform of Cauch. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's really just exponential functions. And so I don't know if the Cauch made it onto the list of formulas. And you, you might say, oh, yeah, that's right. There's a good chunk of the formula sheet that's all about the Laplace transforms. In fact, it's probably the biggest part of the formula sheet. So the next two weeks is us learning what happens. All right, well, that's nice for hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, but what about just normal sine and normal cosine? Can we do those? Well, sure. We go back and we dig through our Calc 2 notes. <coughs> And we say, well, you know, when we took Calc 2, we learned how to integrate things that look like e to the a t sine b t. It was one of those things where you had to do integration by parts twice, and then you had to like move things around and divide. It was sort of the tricky part of integration by parts twice. Because it wasn't just like, oh, you do integration by parts, and then everything goes away. It's like, you do integration by parts, and it's like, oh, we're back to where we started, but not really. And then you go on an adventure. Well, that's okay. We'll just say, all right, we, we have our notes here. Okay, so which one do you want to see, sine or cosine? We'll, we'll do sine. Cosine will be very similar. So the Laplace transform of sine of bt. Well, we apply our definition. Zero to infinity, e to the minus s t times the function sine of b t dt. Well, now we say, all right, come up here, and we say, all right, here, a is going to be minus s, and b will be b. So, according to this, you have minus s, over s squared plus b squared e to the minus st sine of bt. 
and then minus b over s squared plus b squared e to the minus st cosine bt, and you evaluate 0 to infinity. Okay, well, now we start saying, hmm, hmm, let's talk about infinity. We have the exponential and we have versus sine. Here we have exponential versus cosine. Which one wins the race and what happens? Yeah, exponential is going to win. And what does it do? Goes to zero. So the exponential function says things get very, very small. And therefore, at infinity, we get zero. Subtract. Well, now what? Well, we plug in t equals zero. So remember, here, this is at t equals infinity. Plug in t equals zero. What happens? Well, the first term, when you plug in t equals zero, what do you get? You get zero, because sine of zero. The second term, when you plug in t equals zero, what do you get? Well, you get e to the 0 times cosine of 0, which is 1 times this other stuff. So minus b over s squared plus b squared. Well, minus a minus, we end up with b divide s squared plus b squared. So there's the Laplace transform of sine of bt. Now, if you did it for cosine, very similar argument, but now you use this bottom expression, and what you end up with is you end up with s over s squared plus b squared. All right, are you satisfied? Do you need to see the intermediate steps or are you like, I trust you? Good. It's on the formula sheet. So, Well, now that we know how to take the Laplace transform of sine and, and cosine, let's take the Laplace transform of sine and cosine. What? Deja vu. It's coming back. So here's the thing. We've been using the fact that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine, sine theta for quite a while. Whenever we dealt with complex roots of our either, you know, uh, complex eigenvalues or complex roots in ordinary differential equations. And now we're like, hey, it turns out that sine and cosine can be written in terms of exponential functions. And so, how do we use it? Well, what it really says is this function called cosine, which oscillates up and down, and this function called cosh, which looks like a, a hanging chain, are actually the same function. But what we're seeing is two different perspectives on it. So the cosine of bt is the same as the hyperbolic cosine of i bt. Sine of bt hyperbolic sine of i bt divided by i. So this is just a different derivation. Let's come back. We talked about the Laplace transform of Cauch. So the Laplace transform, we'll write down for reference, of Cauch bt was s over s squared minus b squared. So if I take the Laplace transform of cosine, well, using this fact, that's the Laplace transform of cosh of I B T, well, that becomes S over S squared minus I B squared. What happens here? What happens to i squared? Negative 1. So you end up with s over s squared plus b squared. 
what? That's what we just said. Yeah, because it, it works out. Isn't that cool? Wow, life is good. Life is good. And you can do the exact same thing with your, your singe function. So, for instance, you can say, hey, Laplace transform of sine, well, that is the Laplace transform, according to this part here, 1 over i of singe, of i b t. Well, the 1 over i comes out, and if I put an i b t, then you are going to have an i b upstairs, and s squared subtract i b squared. Well, the I's cancel. So you can say the I's have had it, so they, they just stop. And then the I squared, same as before, you get B over S squared plus B squared. So there you go. So that's actually why we call things hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, because they are actually closely related. And so a lot of the properties for exponential functions translate nicely into these uh, trigonometric functions. Now, quick question here. Suppose I ask you the following. What is the Laplace transform of, well, let's just put numbers here, e to the 3t cosine 2t. Are we able to answer this question now? How, how do we go about answering something like this? Do you remember what this does? e to the 3t. What, what's the effect of multiplying by an exponential function? It's a shift. So what you can think of is you can say, hey, I'm going to start with the Laplace transform of cosine of 2t. Well, can we find that? Yeah, we look it up. We say, okay, we found the Laplace transform. It's on our lookup table. What would this be? Well, s over s squared plus 4. Now, we say, okay, whenever we have an exponential function, exponential function tells us shift. How much are we shifting by? Three. So what's the, what's the result? <coughs> yeah. S minus three over S minus three squared plus four. All right, so we're able to to handle exponentials, we're able to handle cosine, able to handle sine, able to handle combinations of the two. Well, all right. Thinking about the kind of functions we like to work with, what are some other functions we like to work with? Yeah, powers of t. And for that, we're going to introduce a new character called the gamma function. And the reason we call it the gamma function is we use the Greek letter gamma here. So that's a capital gamma, gamma of x. Now, you don't have to memorize what this gamma function is um, because it's a really weird function. It is this function e to the minus t, t to the power x minus 1. And you're probably like, huh, huh, okay then. Well. What, what do we do with such a function? Well, there's a couple of things that we can do. There's a couple of facts, or for example, gamma of 1, if we wanted to compute that, gamma of 1, well, according to this, 0 to infinity of e to the minus t, t to the 0. Okay, well, that's minus e to the minus t evaluated from 0 to infinity, which is 0 minus minus 1, which is 1. Okay, so that's why it says gamma of 1 equals 1. And then gamma of a half equals square root of pi because, you know, that's math. It, just when you think you understand stuff, it throws a square root of pi at you. Um, if, if, depending upon how deeply you went in your Calc 2, 
This is one of the things that you learn about in, in oh no, Calc 3, Calc 3. You can prove this using Calc 3 tools. Okay, so what's the punchline? Well, there's a couple of things. Let's figure out how do we take the Laplace transform of t to a power. Well, it tells us right here what you have to do, because this is the definition of taking the Laplace transform of t to a power. Okay, so we have Laplace transform t to the a, 0 to infinity, of e to the minus st times t to the a dt. Well, what's our problem? doesn't quite match with what we have. Because this is e to the minus t, this is e to the minus st. What can we do? What do we do? This is what we have. This is what we'd like it to be. Someone said, make s1. Well, but we need it for arbitrary s. Can we pull out e to the s? Well, they're, they're connected. The s and t are multiplying together. If only there was some other way. Any ideas of what we can choose to do? Think about your integration tools. What's well, like your first go-to tool for integration? Substitution. Substitution. You say, look, this is st, but I want it just to be t. So we're going to make a substitution. We're going to call st. We'll give it a t-like name. We're learning a lot of Greek letters. We learned about gamma. Let's call it tau. Yes. Yes, people are like, yeah, tau. That's where I'm at. OK. Now. Taking the derivative. So remember, t is the variable. s is just a fixed number as far as this integral is concerned. So when I take the derivatives here, I'll have s dt equals d tau. I can also say t is equal to tau over s, because I could divide. So let's see what happens here. We're going to have the integral. We're going to get e to the minus tau, which is okay, tau over s to the power a, dt will become a 1 over s d tau. But the question, the bounds, what happens to the bounds? So for example, when t equals 0, what should tau equal? 0. When t goes towards infinity, what's going to happen to tau? It's going to go to infinity as well. All right, well, what can we do? There's a bunch of s's here. In fact, s to the power a. And there's a s there. So we can pull those s's out, because we are integrating with respect to tau. So it's 1 over s to the a plus 1, integral 0 to infinity of e to the minus tau, tau to the uh, a t tau. Yes? Well, now we say, hey, that looks a lot like the gamma function. The only thing is, instead of x minus 1, we have a. So if I want x minus 1 to be a, what should x be? should be a plus 1. So you have gamma of a plus 1 over s to the a plus 1. All right. So that's the show. All right. Now there's two other bullet points. I'm going to sort of quickly just say this is a true fact by integration by parts. You carry out integration by parts, and what happens is you'll get an x coming out 
and all the other terms behave like they should. OK, so, so that's, I'm going to skip over that. But now, it says, well, what if I take t to the n? n is a whole number. That I do want to, to nail down. All right, so let's just look at some facts. What is gamma of 2? Well, if I use this property with x equals 1, this would be 1 times gamma of 1, also known as 1. What's gamma of 3? Well, that's 2 plus 1, so it's 2 times gamma of 1, which is 2. We're like, wow, not much going on yet, Steve. Don't worry, it's coming. Gamma of 4, 3 plus 1, so it's 3. Gamma of 2, which is 6. Which I'll write as 3 times 2. Then mysteriously times 1, because why not? I'm allowed to. Gamma of 5, 4 gamma of 3, sorry, 4 gamma of 4, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Does that look familiar? What are they? Yeah, they're factorial. So this is like 4 factorial, 3 factorial, 2 factorial. Like these are very excited numbers. They're like, yes, 1, yes, 2, 3, 4. OK, so gamma of n plus 1, if n is a whole number, would be what? N, like, yes, N. And, and so we can say the Laplace transform of t to the n, well, that's gamma of n plus 1 over s to the n plus 1. But we now know that gamma of n plus 1 is our n factorial over s to the n plus 1. So that's what happens there. So where are we going? Where are we going? Well, we're going to build up a bunch of tools. And so right now, we can talk about what have we proved today? Well, what we've proven are things like, how do you take t to the n? n factorial over s to the n plus 1. How do you take cosine, sine? How do you take the exponential, or maybe the exponential times t to the n? Or cosh, or sin? We're building up a repertoire. And once we have our full repertoire, we'll be able to actually comfortably take the Laplace transform of things. And of course, having that will help us answer questions. And that's something that we'll start getting into over the next couple of lectures. But for today, that's it. We're done. <laughs>